Welcome, everybody. Um, I have some breaking news I need to get to you right away in the Riley Strain mystery disappearance, and I think this is a huge break. Not courtesy of the police, not courtesy of the police, courtesy of the media and sleuthers. Tonight we have proof that a homeless man was indeed wearing Riley Strain's shirt two days after Riley disappeared. Not a shirt like Riley's, Riley's actual shirt. In fact, the shirt had Riley's vomit on it. I'm going to walk you through all of this proof in a moment. I'm going to take you step by step along that route that Riley walked that night before vanishing, including the spot where he was seen to be vomiting. And it's important. It's evidence in the case. I'm going to show you where Riley was seen wearing the shirt the entire route, where a family says they saw him lean over a guardrail next to the Cumberland River and vomit at that point, and where a homeless man wearing Riley's shirt says he supposedly found the shirt, although his story does not add up. We've got the video proof uh, to show you there as well. It has been 12 excruciating days for his family. They have been trying to piece together Riley's last steps. Their son is a University of Missouri student who inexplicably disappeared from those streets right there in Nashville. Very small area, too. And the police there don't seem to be finding as much as the media is finding. And the online sleuthers are finding. One of the biggest clues to come along is now all but verified. Riley Strain's distinctive black and white shirt, his contrasting color block shirt, hard to miss in all of that surveillance video that night. You may remember that two days after Riley vanished, there was a woman who serves Nashville's homeless. We've interviewed her here on the show. She saw someone wearing what appeared to be a shirt just like this one, but the homeless person had it underneath his filthy hoodie. Clean shirt underneath a filthy hoodie. She tried to tell the police, but her call went straight to voicemail at the cold case unit. So she didn't stop there. She called Crime Stoppers. And she told the media, including us. Take a look. So on Sunday, I was feeding the homeless with a group of individuals uh, that volunteers. And when we went down to what we call Tent City, which is very near to downtown, um, as we was passing out plates and water, an individual rode up on a bicycle. Um, and he was extremely dirty. Um, he had either a jacket on that was three quarters of the way zipped up or a three quarters zip hoodie. And he had a very clean white shirt under it or a white collar um, with a dark colored pocket on it. Um, he didn't take any food. He only took a couple of bottles of water. Uh, he dropped a bottle of water and almost fell off his bike, reaching down to get it. I re you know, helped him with the bottle of water. I uh, gave it back to him. His shirt was all exposed that was underneath when he was leaned over, um, and then he went off. What stood out to me was, uh, one, that the shirt was very clean. Um, I said to one of the ladies that was with me after he went off, I said, he must have got a new shirt. You're going to hear a lot more about that shirt from the man who got answers about a homeless person who simply says he found the shirt, but that homeless man's story doesn't add up as to where he found it, because the video tells the proof. So that is one piece of the puzzle tonight, but here's another one. Last night, we reported exclusively that a family saw Riley the night he went missing, the night of March 8th, and that family spoke to Riley, and he spoke back to them, and then they witnessed Riley vomit while still wearing that distinctive shirt. And all of this brings me to my first guest tonight who decided to do his own investigation. Chris Salisbury is co-founder of Clean Life, a nonprofit that works to bring resources to the homeless in the Nashville area. Chris, thank you so much for, uh, for joining me tonight. I, I want you to tell uh, our viewers what it was you discovered that is so significant about the shirt that Sabrina Martin who just a moment ago told us she thought she saw on a homeless man. You went further and got even more information. Tell me what you learned. So, uh, uh, and thank you for having me. Um, so when I seen the, <clears throat> the podcast with uh, Sabrina on there, uh, my first thing was to, to, to go check it out to see if, one, if, if, if I could rule out anybody at the camp because I've grown to love them down there. Um, and there, and there's some really good people there. Um, but two, to see if there's any validity to it. Um, cause we've all been following the Riley strain, 
uh, situation. So uh, when I got down there, I, you know, just kind of put my feelers out because a lot of the people down there trust me. And there's a lot of people down there that, you know, are, are more than willing to help and, and to provide information for things like that. Um, the first contact that I talked to, she told me that um, she said the word is that a guy named Ross had the shirt down there. Um, so I talked to her for a little bit. Another guy told me that he seen, um, the shirt on the same guy. And the reason he noticed it because it was bigger, uh, and it kind of went down further because the guy uh, in question allegedly that had the shirt, um, is, is, is about my height, which is five, eight. Um, and then, uh, I left and I got a text message from the same girl. She said, she actually asked Ross, because when I was down there, I said, hey, have him call me um, if he had the shirt or if he, you know, tell him to call me. Let's see if we can link him up with the investigators or something to, you know, to maybe get this shirt to him. Uh, she said that she talked to him and that he said he was looking for copper uh, over there by the Fort Nashboro. It's like a, a log cabin style building right there on Riverfront and that he found it on the railing and that it had puke on it. And he, and he just wiped it off, uh, wiped the puke off and then put it on. Um, and, and, and that's what, uh, multiple people said they seen him with that shirt. There was about four or five, uh, that identified him with that shirt. So even if you maybe were suspect of the first person you asked, you said subsequent people had the same story about this man who you said is his name is Ross, but I think you also aren't sure that that's his real name. Is that correct? Right. So um, immediately when I found this information out, um, I immediately tried to call Crime Stoppers and the line was busy. Um, so as I was pulling out of the homeless encampment, uh, there was a Metro police officer parked in parallel with the camp. So I pulled right over to him and uh, let him know the information. I also had video of the, uh, uh, of the you know, encounter of the people telling me this and some of the stuff that they told me. Um, and I was able to show him the video. And while I was there, um, another police uh, policeman pulled up um, and also an undercover pulled up. So I was able to tell three different vehicles of police, exactly the situation. Uh, I showed them the, the, the video. Um, and then I also called my contact from um, uh, Tent City, and she was able to explain that over the phone while I was there with the police about exactly what he said and where he found it. Um, and then uh, I told him the name. And, and one of the ways I was able to, to identify him was – because he had gotten a, some sort of a, a altercation with another guy at the camp where the other guy actually went to jail that night. So when I was telling the police officer about this, because I've had a, a relationship with this police officer before in the camp, um, I've had to you know call the police for a situation down there before, um, he was able to pull the guy up immediately on his laptop, and I was able to say, yeah, that's, that's who they're saying had the shirt. So... Um, and that's, a, and, and that's kind of where it ended at that point. So that man who was seen by multiple people wearing Riley's shirt with vomit on it, which is a brand new detail, and it links up to the family who saw Riley vomiting right just a few hundred yards from where the homeless encampment is. Uh, that man is known to the police. The police know about these reports now. And do you know at this point, Chris, if the police have located the man who goes by the name of Ross, who was seen wearing Riley's shirt with vomit on it? I honestly don't know. I have made a couple uh, uh, calls down there, um, and they said they've seen police down there, but they don't know if they've talked to them or not. So um, they did, you know, they Chris, they one said, other thing. Yeah. You, sure. you just gave me a detail. You said that that man who goes by the name of Ross, who was seen wearing Riley's shirt with the vomit on it, said to them, I found it on a railing near Fort Nashboro building between Gay Street and Broadway. And that may not sound like uh, it, it, it makes sense to the national audience, but I will tell you in a moment, I'm going to show Riley's exact steps and that exact point. And it's impossible. It's impossible 
for Riley to have taken off his shirt with vomit on it and put it in the location where that homeless man described finding it because it's way out of a, out of the distance. It's far away from where Riley was seen on um, on surveillance video. So at least that part of where the, the homeless man says he found Riley's shirt on a railing it doesn't add up. Chris, will you keep us posted on other details that you hear and check back in with us? It's remarkable information that you've brought to this to this puzzle. And thank God for you, honestly, um, because, you know, nobody seems to be able to get the police to listen to their reports. And yet you were able to. And I, I so appreciate you doing that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And I, I will absolutely keep you updated. And I've talked to the family today and sent all the video to them so that they can, you know, they can, you know, try to get with the police. I asked to talk to the investigators as well because I hadn't got a call or anything uh, uh, since Saturday. So, Well, it's critical. And you know what, uh, Chris, thank you, because um, we've got a couple of family members who are going to uh, talk to us live in just a moment. They'll talk to us about the information you and I just discussed and the fact that it is just so hard to get the Nashville police to find this information on their own and um, and even take this information from willing willing people wanting to give this evidence. Uh, I'll also mention the number of days that we've been asking the Nashville police to come on the uh, program to help find Riley Strain and how many times we've been declined. Chris Salisbury, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. And we will have Chris Salisbury back. In the meantime, we have also seen multiple maps, multiple videos of Riley Strain's wanderings that night. But unless you're right down at street level, it's kind of hard to, to see these videos and figure out which direction he went and, and when he went there. So what we've done is we've put together a video from Riley's point of view so that we can all see exactly where he went that night and what Riley saw and where he turned and where he went off the radar. So um, we're going to begin this at, uh, at the bar. It's called Luke's 32 Bridge. You've heard about it. It's the bar where Riley was asked to leave uh, when the staff had deemed him to be too drunk to serve. That, that's the front door right there. Okay. Um, Riley left on March 8th at 9.40 p.m. You walked out uh, those doors. And you've seen that shot before more than likely. You walked out those doors. But when you're looking at the bar from this angle, uh, his hotel would be to the right. You'd come out the front door, and, you know, from this point of view, you turn to the right, and um, the river is off to the left. But I want to turn you around and show you what Riley saw as he walked out of that bar. This is his view, okay? He's street level now at the front door of Luke's, okay? If you turn to the left, that's where he should have walked. Just turn to the left and walk 12 minutes, and you would be home free at the hotel. This is Broadway. You're looking at the cross street, right, where the taxi's right there. That's Broadway. It's busy. Riley didn't turn left on Broadway. He didn't go to the hotel. He went straight. He walked right across that intersection where all those people are, right? This is third. Riley started walking north on third instead. So we're going to cross the street and take the steps as Riley would have. And we're going to speed up some of it as well so that you won't have to take the long walk. Um, but I'm going to take you on the exact journey. And you can see how busy it is, right? This is last night. So on a, on a Wednesday night, um, midweek, it, it's busy, right? It's busy. This is Tuesday night. Riley would have possibly crossed the street here, gone to the other side of the street, and then, and then gone down the sidewalk following the guy in the, the left, uh, in, the, in the yellow. But you can also see how many businesses. It's busy with people. It's busy with businesses. It's busy with bars. You can see, right? Um, what I want you to know, though, is this distance is quite a ways, so I'm going to speed up the video because he's going to walk north on 3rd here for, for quite some time, right? And he's going to end up towards the end at Commerce Street. Before I get there, though, um, I want you to know that, that Riley also went to a couple other bars, Friends in Low Places, that's owned by Garth Brooks, also uh, Casa Rosa, which is Miranda Lambert's bar. Uh, he stopped maybe, presumably here, at, at a red light because... Uh, we had to slow down and, and wait for the traffic, but we're going to cross this street. Um, we're not at Commerce yet, okay? We want to get to the next street. That's, that's where Riley's going to turn right on Commerce Street. Um, but you can see it starts to get a little less busy, right? Not as many bars, not as many people, not as many pedestrians. And here's a significant part. We're going to cross past this food truck 
and get up to Commerce Street, we're going to end up with a parking lot on our right. Now, Riley kind of veered off to the right there and cut this parking lot, but our video actually goes around the corner. But, but Riley's cut the parking lot off, right? And this is the surveillance video. Uh, sorry, this is church, not commerce. I, I beg your pardon. This is church. Um, that post right there, this is the post that Riley ran into, okay? You saw the surveillance video of him running across the parking lot and falling at that post. That's the post. But he got up and he kept going, right? You're on church. I misspoke. I said commerce. This is church. He kept walking down church. There's that video of the, see that? There's the brick wall. He's stumbling past this brick wall on church. This, he's really having a tough time here, okay? It's important because he's still heading um, towards the river here. He's going to get close to, to 2nd Avenue and he's going to cross 2nd Avenue up here. But look at how different it, this is not, what you would think of as like where my hotel is anymore. Now there's a lot of construction. And Riley must have been under the influence so badly, he didn't even really notice. You're not in the bar district anymore. You're not in the hotel district anymore. The sidewalks are getting narrower. There's no pedestrians here, like really almost none. In fact, there's a couple of homeless people he's going to pass. One of them is going to be at the end uh, in a doorway to the right. It's going to go by pretty quickly. But as he passes uh, our camera goes past the doorway, you'll see like a homeless man who's like hanging out. But there's a scaffolding too, so really, really sketchy now, this area. Riley's not noticing it though. Here comes the homeless man on the right. There he is there. And he's going to cross this crosswalk, okay? And the river's on the other side. And it's going to bend slightly. Uh, it's going to bend along the river. Now you're basically crossing first towards Gay. I call it a promenade. And I'm going to ask Jamie, our director, to pause the video in a little bit where you see that railing start, okay? It's important. This is a really important spot. Pause this video. See where that railing starts? Okay. The homeless man who said that he found the shirt with the vomit on it says he found it on a railing way down near Broadway. Well, that is like a couple blocks back to the right, okay? Riley wasn't anywhere near this railing, and the railing doesn't even go to Broadway, it starts here. It starts here. Okay, this is important because there's no way. This is church and gay right here. This is church and gay. There's no way that railing went anywhere near where the homeless guy said it did. So let's keep the video going because this is where a family says they spotted Riley. They had their cars parked right where that white one is, like right around where the white one is. They spotted Riley. They said to him, like, are you driving? Cause, cause you shouldn't be. And he said to them, no, I'm too drunk to, dr I'm too drunk to even drive. I, I, I'm almost too drunk to walk. So they went ahead and they got into their cars here, but then they looked back because they were worried. They saw Riley vomiting over this railing right around here. Okay. And they know that because they actually like took a second look to make sure he was still walking. Okay. They were worried. They were worried he was going to fall over. That railing is only about like knee to waist height. You could easily fall over that. It's like a guardrail right? It's not high. So they specifically made note. They saw Riley vomit and then they saw that he was safe and he continued to walk. That's important. Let's keep the video going. Um, the way I see this at this point is that Riley continued to walk that, that railing, that guardrail, but I want to switch it to a different light because for about 300 yards, that railing continues. You can't really see it in the dark. So we shot it again in the daylight so you can see what it looks like along that road next to a very steep embankment. Very steep. So let's, let's roll the daylight video. Okay, we're, we're carrying on with that railing now. And now you can see the river is right there. Yeah? You couldn't see that in the dark, but now you can. Right? So now Riley is walking this, but at night, you can see... The, the river is like, I don't know, maybe 20, 30, 40 yards, depending on the spot, a very, very steep embankment from that, from that guardrail or that railing. And what you're going to come upon now, if you can see in the distance, there's like some bridges on the way, right? You're going to start seeing some bridges emerge. See them right there? We are pretty sure that Riley may have gotten to those bridges because his bank card was found under the first one. And his phone pinged under the second one, which is right past the first one. Now, did Riley have his bank card? Did Riley have his phone when it last pinged and then went dead? I don't know. That's hard to say. But you can see that that, that railing ended, the wall ended, right? The guardrail ended. As we head towards Woodland Street Bridge, the first one, 
you can see that now it's just brush, right? There's nothing that separates you from the river down below, just this, just this woods, like brush. There's not a lot of it. And then past the Woolen Street Bridge will be the second one, which is called the, the James Robertson. But there's a couple of other like things that you should see as we walk this embankment. You're going to start seeing a few homeless people. And again, if Riley was walking here, there's nobody here at night, right? There's cars that are parked, but you are now no businesses, no pedestrians. But you start seeing some evidence of like homeless activity. This is the bridge to the right on the other side of that wall where the bank card was found down the embankment, okay? But we're going to keep going. because, And the reason we're going to keep going was because we see more homeless people after this bridge. And we also know that his phone pinged. See, the media is all camped out there, right? Because they know this is an important area. The phone pinged somewhere between here and that next bridge, that, that uh, James Robertson Parkway bridge. When we get there, by the way, there's going to be like a little homeless guy encampment. Uh, he's got his stuff all set up on a bench up here. You're going to pass by it. And you can also see another person. I'm not sure if it's a homeless person walking a dog, but the, the person's going to come around with the dog. There is a lot of homeless activity down to the right in that embankment. But why I'm going to take you under the James Robertson um, Parkway Bridge is because you're going to see real clearly how steep the embankment is and how close the water is when you get there. Media, again, all camped out here because this is all the critical area. So as we get up to this railing, take a look over the right. Camera's going to pan. You'll see it. That is how close the water is. That is is how steep, drop that banner if you can, guys. That is how steep it is, and that's where the water is. That should give you an idea of Riley's steps. Yes, I sped them up, but it's only about, I don't know, 10 to 15 minute walk if you were to walk it. And if you were going as slowly as Riley and stopping and falling, maybe a little bit longer, but that's what it looked like. So I don't want you to go anywhere at this point. We are staying on this story because with every single hour comes a brand new detail on this mysterious disappearance. And Riley Strain's mom and stepdad are live with me after the break to react to the news that we discovered tonight. That shirt was Riley's. The one that was seen on the homeless man, it was Riley's. They're next. There are videos, eyewitnesses, cell phone pings, a bank card, and now there's Riley Strain's shirt. But almost two weeks after the visiting student walked away from a Nashville night spot and vanished, there's still no sign of Riley. Riley Strain's mother and stepfather, Michelle and Chris Whited, join me live now. Um, thank you to the both of you. Again, I am so sorry we're meeting under these circumstances. I, I know that you were able to listen to the interview that I just did with um, Chris Salisbury, who was able to go and find his own um, surveillance information based on the homeless community and discovered that the homeless man who was wearing Riley's shirt uh, was wearing shirt with vomit on it and said that he found it on a railing, although... Where he says he found it doesn't add up. I wanted to get your reaction. Chris, I'll start with you. It's not new information to us. We've heard this rumor since last Tuesday. Um, nothing's been co collaborated. Um, we know from watching the body cam footage from the officer that interacted with Riley from um, approximately right, I'm going to say, 50, 40 to 50 yards away from the Wood, Woodson Bridge. When they zoomed in on Riley with the camera, you couldn't see any puke on the shirt. Um, he spoke to the officer. We heard him speak. He didn't sound intoxicated at that point in time. So, you know, yes, every kid five seconds sober up period when they see a cop, but he was walking good. We saw him walk from that point underneath the bridge, saw him come out the other side. We even saw him jog a little bit until he went out of sight, coming up on the James Robertson Bridge, approximately where that sign that says 14 foot three um, for the height on the James Robertson is where Riley was last seen on video just to kind of help so Chris, clarify. Yeah, no, that's really important because we have not seen video of Riley emerging from the Woodland Street Bridge walking towards the James Robertson Parkway Bridge, which is the last place that, that, that the phone pinged, right, in between those two. Um, Correct. 
So have you seen video that the rest of us have not? Have the police shared that with you? Yes, we have seen the last known footage of Riley as he approaches the James Robertson Bridge. Can you give me a little bit more of a, of a detail about what you saw, what the video showed, and was it crystal clear whether he had vomit on the shirt or not? Not, not from there. The, the best video that we had to see that, and that you could tell looking at Riley that there was no, no injuries to his head was on the body cam video. I don't know if you've seen the body cam video or not that the police have released. It is out there. It can be seen. Um, you can even hear Riley talking. Yes. Yes, we've definitely yeah. aired that where he has the encounter with the police officer. It's very brief. Yeah. How are you doing tonight, sir? Doing well. Um, and he did appear to have sobered up quickly. It was hard to tell if his shirt was completely clean at that point. I will say this, that Chris Salisbury says that the um, homeless uh, people that he canvassed, multiple homeless people he canvassed about the man named Ross wearing the shirt, uh, said that Ross had said he found the shirt with vomit on it and that they saw the, the vomit on it. Is it possible that Riley um, passed the family? They witnessed him vomiting over the side rail. They, they said that they saw that happen and they were worried about him. And so they kept an eye oh, yeah. on him to make sure he was still walking and hadn't fallen. So they witnessed him vomiting. Is it possible that a couple hundred yards later, before you got to the first bridge, it might have happened again? That he might have actually have, uh, thrown up again, maybe even after he had the encounter with the police officer. If it was anywhere, I would say it was after he went off camera for the last time we saw him. Because the time frame that we're talking from when he crossed the street down there at Church and Gay to the last time he was seen on video is less than three minutes. And, so, and a critical, a critical three minutes know, as well. He's, he's moving really what good. Is, you know, yeah, go that's ahead. a good clip for a walk. And, you know, we're talking a total of uh, five to seven minutes of total missing time after that. What do you make of the fact that several reputable uh, people, um, uh, Sabrina Martin, who we played at the beginning of the show, who works with the homeless and, and made note of that very distinctive shirt. She didn't even know about the story about Riley. She, she'd never heard there was a missing student. She just remembers serving that man water and realizing the shirt underneath his dirty hoodie was very clean and had a big black pocket on it. She's the first account of the shirt. The second account being Chris Salisbury, who said that other homeless people saw it. What do you make of the fact that if that homeless person, Ross, was telling the truth, he was picking up the shirt over the railing blocks and blocks south in an area where Riley never walked. We know because we know from the video right. where he walked, and he was nowhere near Broadway and, uh, and Gay Street. What do you make of that whole notion that there might be a man out there who did have Riley's shirt, and where do you think he got it? We knew that. We'd have a lot more answers for what we're looking for right now. Like I said... When he goes off video at that street sign saying the height there by the bridge going in under James Robertson, that's the last we've ever seen him on video. Still had the shirt on at did that the point police, time. Did they update you? Um, have, I know you've spoken with them every day since Sunday. Have they updated you with um, satisfying information or helpful information? And are they telling you a lot of things they haven't told us? Um, we feel like that we've gotten good information from them since, you know, the weekend has started. Um, we also brought in our own people with the United Cajun Navy, and Dave Flagg is working directly with them, and he's also coordinating our response as far as search efforts that we're doing and everything. We feel like between the two, we really are focusing quite well on what's going on, and we're getting more details. We also met with the mayor after our press conference on Monday. I think it was Monday. Yeah. Um, so Tuesday, we, we met with the mayor and his team. So yes, we're getting more information. Yes, 
new things are coming in. I know that they have talked to the Sabrina Martin. Um, I don't know what become of that yet, but I do know that they were talking to her because they told us Finally. that they were getting... Good. Thank God. Because as of last night when we had Sabrina Martin on the show, she said they had not reached out to her. And I was just devastated to hear uh, that, you know, nine, ten days had passed since uh, Sabrina had made her report. Michelle, can I just ask you this? We're at day 12. And uh, today I know there was searching going on at the dam and that they found nothing. Um, as a mom, I, I would have been relieved by that. Um, I wondered about you at the moment when they made the report that they found nothing uh, at the dam today. It's, it's just all hard. It's all very hard. I'm, I mean, I'm thankful. I don't know how to feel, honestly. It's, it's hard. It's all heartbreaking. We just want to find our son. And... I'm sorry. I understand. I understand. We want to help you find your son, and um, I've been very frustrated. I know. Go ahead, we, Michelle. We appreciate the help. We do. We love. Thank you for getting the word out about our boy. And we have asked the Nashville police to join us every single night of this story to get the word out. Um, because we know that viewers are responding. We know that TikTokers are responding. We know that social media and bloggers um, have actually helped to advance evidence in this case. And they have uh, refused every single night that we've requested that they be on the air to help update this case and keep it in the public eye. So um, I'll tell you what, you have our commitment um, that we are going to continue to try to solve this exhaustingly sad mystery um, but I I can tell you from the bottom of our hearts we feel for you thank you for being on um, Chris Whited and Michelle Whited sorry I'm going to continue doing the show we're going to continue putting evidence together and um and we will continue to be in touch with you thank you for being on tonight you're welcome just one more thing we have more crews coming in Tech texas equisearch is coming in to help they'll be here friday drones in the air saturday and sunday ryan riley's dad is still on the river with the crews right now so we got a lot of stuff going and thank you for all the help equisearch EquiSearch is a phenomenal organization. I've worked with them for over 20 years. You'll be in great hands with them. Um, they do great work and they have uh, great results. So I, I, I am hoping that um, yields positive results. Thank you again, guys, for being on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna uh, continue with the program. I'm sorry that I'm breaking up a little. Riley's about the same age as my kids. I have a son named Ridley, very close to the name Riley. I'm so sorry, I don't typically do this. Um, okay, so we've got a podcaster who's coming up next who has been able to, to bring a lot of information to the forefront, more so than it seems uh, the police have been able to get. And so we're going to interview him live in a moment. I'm going to get myself together. Really sorry about this. Be right back after this break. You know, the, uh, the media and podcasters and TikTokers have found a whole lot of evidence in the case of missing Riley Strain. The police, on the other hand, have been really difficult to work with. We've called for 12 days and we've had, uh, we've been refused every day to have the police on the air to update this story. And um, numerous people that we've spoken to who found information, found the bank card, found Riley's shirt on a homeless man, um, saw Riley leaning over and vomiting. Those people all called the police and got put into voicemail for the cold case unit. And many of them didn't get called back. 
starting to get calls back now. Thank God for that. I want to bring in Pascal Beaubeuf. His podcast and YouTube channel, The Pascal Show, has a huge sh- subscriber uh, following, and his audience has really dug into Riley's disappearance, and they've been coming up with information. Pascal, uh, thank you so much. Uh, or, or uh, Pascal, I, I appreciate you coming on and, and, and doing this. Thank you for, for being on the program. Earlier, you and I um, have both spoken now to Chris Salisbury, and he talked about the, um, the homeless man who was wearing Riley's shirt. Other homeless people who saw that, multiple, upwards of four, who corroborated that they saw this man named Ross, that's the name he uses, wearing Riley's shirt, that it had vomit on it, and that mm-hmm. this homeless man said he, saw, he, he got it on a railing uh, near Broadway and, um, and Gay Street, which just doesn't add up. But, but what I'm fascinated by, Pascal, is that Michelle and Chris Whited, who just did an interview with me, said that they've seen additional video that the rest of us haven't seen, that the police have shown the video of Riley wearing his shirt as he passes under Woodland Street Bridge, but before he gets to the James Robertson Parkway. What do you make of that? You know, honestly, there are so many questions, so many things that just keep on popping up in this thing. We're going left, right, up, down in circles. It's uh, <laughs> it's driving me crazy. I don't know if it's driving you crazy. Um, uh, honestly, uh, you know, I, I still am wondering how that happened. What what's going on and why did it stop right there? I'm still kind of I throw my arms up in the air and say, what actually happened here? You know? Yeah. Well, especially now that, you know, the, the White had said that they have seen video from the police the rest of us haven't seen yeah. after Riley reaches the Woodland Street Bridge. Yet the homeless man who goes by Ross says he found the shirt hanging over a railing, oh, half a mile back. Uh, so none of that makes any sense. But you're getting a lot of people calling in with information, aren't you? Absolutely. Um, every person that has stepped forward talking about everything from the shirt with the vomit on it, on it to the homeless guy wearing the shirt uh, wearing Riley's shirt underneath the hoodie uh and then some have been calling in and just pouring as much information as they can about this um and it's been a blessing just to get all these stories and and get all these accounts uh it's been painting quite a picture i mean at least we're getting more pieces to the puzzle to this very confusing case yeah. Yeah. And, and very um, frustrating case, uh, given the fact that the police have been less than helpful, not only to the media, but also to the witnesses. Um, you know, it's just very, very frustrating. Pascal, I'm going to stay in touch with you. Thank you for doing this tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you. Pascal Bobuf has a, a great show. Thank you. It's called The Pascal Show. He's got a, a great subscriber base. You can find it wherever you stream your, your podcasts or on YouTube as well. And we'll have Pascal back on the program as well. Uh, still to come, today investigators did something called Burping the River. Um, they were doing it so that they could look for Riley. It's a very strange name for a, a purpose that's important. Um, they were hoping it might yield some important clues and results. I'll explain what happened. We've got uh, our Evan Lambert actually on the water. He's up next. Do it my way. Coligard is a one-of-a-kind way to screen for colon cancer that's effective and non-invasive. It's for people 45 plus at average risk, not high risk. False positive and negative results may occur. Ask your provider for me, Coligard. Major announcement from law enforcement today, but it was not from the Nashville police. Instead, a sheriff's department uh, representative, um, 42 miles downstream from Nashville at the Cheatham Dam, um, had been searching there, and they were, quote, burping the river. That's what they do when they shut down the waterway to let anything that might be submerged at the dam float to the top. And that process began at noon today. But at 4 p.m., the sheriff made the announcement that nothing, that is to say no body, was found at the dam 40 miles away. Back in the city, though, the United Cajun Navy stepped up its search of the Cumberland River near the Woodland Street Bridge and the James Robertson Parkway Bridge, That's the area where Riley's cell phone pinged for the last time. And now we've learned tonight where he was last seen on video. The Cajun Navy added boats, a helicopter, and a canine unit. And News Nation's Evan Lambert joined them today, joins me now. So any updates, um, or are they still searching through the debris that may have actually come up when they were burping the river? 
Hey, Ashley, uh, so we have heard no updates tonight. We know that that was the last thing they were doing was searching through that debris. I talked to the sheriff myself who told me uh, that this afternoon they had not found a body. They had not found anything connected to Riley Strain. And we were on the water with the folks at the Cajun Navy for about four hours today. When they had their boats in the river, they were mainly doing a visual search. But what's going on tonight, hopefully, and we haven't seen any boats go by us in the last few minutes, but they told us that they were going to be back out on the river tonight with sonar and with lights on the boats that really can give them a much better view at what is at the top of the water. It was just so murky today. The sun was a problem, just reflecting off the top of the water. So it really was difficult for anyone to spot anything. That's why the focus was on the river banks, because it was a little bit more shallow over there, and that's where you could see a little bit more. Uh, but, but nothing that we found when we were out there, nothing uh, found some 40 miles uh, down the river near Ashland City after they had to do that burping. That's something that I had never heard of, but it just stops the system there, allows everything, uh, anything that's close to the surface to come up to the top of the river, and uh, that is something uh, that is key for what they were looking. We were talking to several people uh, who know the city well, who work down here, said that in the past with uh, investigations, things that have, or people, unfortunately, that have gone into the river have washed up uh, in Ashland City, and so they made the attempt to, to search there, but nothing as far as, as we have heard tonight. I, I have precious little time left, about 40 seconds here, uh, Evan, but searching at night, I'm just uh, confused. If it was hard during the day, why would they go back out at night? And again, only about 25 seconds. Sure, so they say, and it's, it's illogical the way they explained it to me, but with the light on the boats, that really allows them to penetrate down through the water, and they say they have much more visibility. They also have that technology like sonar that they can put to use to combine those two things, and so they actually think that they have a better shot at finding something at night rather than during the day and with all the sunlight. It's unbelievable. All right, Evan, thank you for being out there and, and give us the update again tomorrow because there may be some information overnight as well. Appreciate that. Evan Lambert has been out there for several days and he's going to stay on the story as well. We promise we will too. You see the address, Banfield Tips at NewsNationNow.com. If you know something, send us a note. Call the police for sure, but also send us a note. Thanks for being here, everyone. Cuomo's up next. <laughs>